Please note that this video contains spoilers. Put off by how long this video is, don't worry, I tend to jam-pack my videos with as much content, as many details as I possibly can, and I try to talk pretty fast, so while the video is a bit on the long side, I don't repeat myself, and I get into a lot of details about the subject that, you know, pretty much anything that I feel I can comment on and that I think you might find interesting. The Lord of the Rings, The Return of the King, movie thoughts. I really like the resolution to Gollum and Smeagol after having given up on being 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 appreciated, I guess, and now just just wanting the ring back. You know the the length lengths he goes to with the, the giant spider and you think that he dies getting kicked off the but you know we've seen him climb straight down you know vertically so if he didn't die from that fall of course he could climb back up and follow him he knew where Mount Doom was and you know their head start was messed up with you know, Frodo being unconscious and, you know, captured by the orcs and all that, so, yeah, it makes good enough sense that he could catch up to them, and he's, he's literally ready to kill Frodo to get the ring, after having thought of him as a friend, and it again, like I told about the thoughts on for Two Towers, it shows the depths of addiction. He is... It's its all that matters to him at this point. He is... at Now, he is too far gone. He, there is no reclaiming his humanity. He gets a second chance to make the choice that he does at the beginning of the film in the you know, flashback. And he makes the same choice. It's... It's over. He... He has resolved to be Gollum, and when he, yeah, you know, when, when he, he, he bites the finger off to, to get the ring, and even being, you know, knocked over, he's, he's so happy, he doesn't think for a second that maybe he should get away from the pit of lava, he's just, he's so happy. He has his precious back, and it's been so many years, and I just he can't believe it. And actually, it hasn't been years, so I'm not entirely sure, but it's been a long time. And even when he gets knocked over the edge and falls down, he just grabs his precious, and it's just, it's fine. He's, he's reunited with his precious and he disappears, as does the ring, into the lava. And it, yeah, it's, it's really well done. I think the, they, they did pretty much everything with Gollum absolutely perfect in the trilogy. I am going to try to talk about something other than Gollum, because I'm sure that the people watching these videos are getting sick of it by now. I really like Frodo's development over the course of these films. I'm not going to be spoiling anything from, from the first two. With how, at this point, you know, it, Gollum manages to really drive a wedge between the two with the, you know, the thing with the bread. And in spite of Sam's yeah, Sam sacrifices for Frodo. Frodo still turns on him because of the lies of Gollum and the manipulation of Gollum and because of the power of the ring. Because Gollum uses that, he knows how the ring works. So he tells Frodo that soon Sam will be asking for the ring. He wants your ring. But 
it's yours. You don't want to give it to him. And when Sam predictably asks for the ring, because he can tell, you know, Gollum and Sam can both tell what is actually going on with Frodo, that the ring is taking him over. He's becoming obsessed with it. And Gollum hits first and uses lies and manipulation to make things seem different than they are. And it's, it's an age-old tactic that when there is something negative, the one who is the most deceptive, if they strike first, if they plant a lie, plant the seed, and then the other, you know, then it seems like it's come true, then the deceptive entity will probably win, at least in the short run. And, yeah, it's, it's really compellingly done. And even, even after that, Sam doesn't give up on him. And the whole thing with the spider, I could go over it detail by detail. I think I'll limit it to saying I freaking love the sequence. I'm not even an arachnophobe. I don't really care if I was spiders one way or the other. But that scene really terrifies you. Even if you don't care about spiders. It's, it's just really, really cool. Really well done. Really convincing spider. Really great design. It's such... It's such a nasty looking spider. It was one of the creatures I was talking about in the review with, with the most memorable and best creature designs of the entire trilogy. And yes, yeah, so so what happens to Frodo ending up with him out there on the very edge, about to throw the ring. He takes it off, holds it over, and Sam is yelling to do it, you know, and, and he's carried Frodo all the way up there. He knew if I ask for the ring, he's going to think I'm trying to take it and that's not what I, I just want to help him. So he gets him all the way up there and Frodo goes over and he's about to toss the ring and, and then it convinces him and you see it in the eyes and he turns around and the eyes and the smile and just, ugh, it's really creepy and he puts the ring on and you're screaming no in tune with Sam. You're like, you've come so far, you can't, it can't end. Now it can't end like that. It's just, like I said in the review, it's one of the many times in the movie where things seem hopeless. It really looks like this is it. You also think that Frodo has died from the, the, the spider stabbing him. And the whole thing, you know, and, and when Gollum comes back for a second there, you think that maybe he might actually manage to kill Frodo because he's so close and just the whole thing. But yeah, he he slips the finger on, turns invisible, and it's just, it's devastating. And then Gollum comes back and bites the finger off. And that's how far he, Gollum is willing to go. I really didn't mean to bring, about, bring Gollum back, but yeah, it's just, it's so nasty. And that also kind of, you know, obviously, a part of it is that Frodo gets the ring back off and it's no longer in his possession so he kind of wakes up, but also the fact that he's just gotten his finger bit off over this ring. It, I feel like he looks at Gollum, I promise I'm going to try to make this the last I talk about Gollum, and he sees what he could become. He sees that if he does not let it go, and if he does not destroy it, he will become like that. Or if he if he doesn't destroy it, but just casts it aside, lets someone else find it, then someone else is going to become the next Gollum. And he... He makes that decision. He just... He can't let that happen. It, and I suppose that's the ultimate expression of his sympathy for Gollum. That he... He realizes he can't save him, but he won't let anyone else become him. And, yeah, I, I think it's a fantastic way to deal with it. I, I think in real life, at times, some people are at least very difficult to save. I don't, 
I don't know if anyone's truly beyond saving, but it, it can be, it can seem impossible at times. And what you want to do when you see someone seemingly beyond saving is, in my opinion, understand what brought them there and try to fix it for future generations. Try to keep it from happening to anyone else. And I, I really, I understand why Tolkien has inspired so many with these these kinds of notions, actually, to come to think of it. Having not read the book, I suppose, I don't know if, it's, if that entire thing was Tolkien's original idea, but... Now, the... Sauron... I realized that he was evil before he was defeated, before he, you know, became just an eye and, you know, his life force trapped in the ring. But still, I can't help but wonder, I mean, they mention, they, they even point this out, and I, without a lid, that poor bastard is just constantly looking. He, he can't blink. Can you imagine that? I mean, when I think about how much my eyes itch just after a night where I don't sleep that many hours, as many hours as I maybe should, and he doesn't even have fingers that could go and, and I, I don't know, does he get some work to do it? I'd be afraid that those things would be way too rough-handed with, and, and they'd probably, like, time, can that eye actually hurt? Could he, like, dislocate the retina or something? I, I don't know, and just, yeah, I mean, when, when you think about that, you kind of understand why he's evil. I mean, never being able to stretch around, right, just always looking, and when you see him near the end of the film, when you really see him, we've seen glimpses throughout the trilogy, but you see that he's just basically, he's got this lighthouse kind of thing going on where he's just shining a beam of light, which almost has Frodo just staying out, you know, the ring again, trying to get him to, and to screaming, I'm over here, Sauron, look at me. You know, it's just like this child trying to get its parents' attention. Anyway, he's got this eye beam thing going on and he's just constantly spinning on his axis with this eye beam going. The, the, the poor guy is basically a radar at this point. I just, I don't know, I'm, I'm starting to sympathize a little bit. You'd be pretty ticked off if that was your fate. Among the many endings to this film are of course Frodo waking back up in bed, being watched by Gandalf, who was clearly just standing there waiting for the right moment to start laughing. I was starting to wonder if maybe Frodo had mispronounced Gandalf's name since he was laughing quite that much, and then, you know, his cousins start coming in, what's the, what's the joke? What, what are people laughing at in here? And Slowly everyone enters, ending with Sam. Were they standing in line out there, just like, you know, waiting for the next person to, and, and just allowing enough time for it to be nice and dramatic, satisfying, before the next one entered? You know, did, did they actually have a debate over who would, who should be the first, who should be the last? You know, it's just, yeah, silly. And before that, we of course have the two expecting to die off on this cliff after the, you know, the volcano got indigestion from, you know, I was gonna say is the ring with all its evil, but frankly, Gollum is probably pretty nasty to try to digest, so yeah, it's probably because of him that it just explodes into lava. And maybe also, 
you know, traditionally you sacrifice virgins to volcanoes, so don't know if Gollum fits the bill on that one. And uh, yes, <laughs> you're you're welcome for the nasty, nasty images of a CGI Andy Circus having sex. Anyway, yes, so they're they're on this cliff and these three eagles come by and one of them is carrying Gandalf. And then the one carrying Gandalf picks up one of the hobbits and one of the other two picks up the other hobbit. And then the third one's like, why did I why did you guys invite me here? I don't have anything to pick up. This is so pointless. I should have just stayed at home. My wife made this nice little dinner for the whole family. She was gonna I don't even know if eagles do the thing of vomiting food into their baby smiles. Anyway, I think that might be more or less. I do quite like. I found it slightly corny. Actually, it's probably just me being a cynic. It's it really isn't corny when Legolas and Gimli are friends. It's it's. It's sweet. It's a nice moment. You know, the thing I, I never thought I'd die in battle alongside an elf. And, and, and yeah, what is it he call him, calls him an, an elf? I, I don't remember. And Legolas responds, how about a friend? I, that would be okay. And it, it just, yeah. It, it was good. And, and there continued feuding over the over who kills the most and, and counting as 21, 20, and, Legolas gets up on the, you know, prehistoric giant elephant thing, elephant, sorry, I guess it's French, and just, you know, takes out all the guys on top, and takes out the elephant, slides down, I think the, crap, what's it called, the, the nose thing, and right after, Gimli's like, it still only counts as one! That was pretty funny, I will have to say. One other joke that I genuinely enjoyed in this might be the only time I've really laughed at the Hobbits, particularly when Pip is about to enter Minas Tirith to, to talk to the steward, and literally Gandalf says, you know, you probably shouldn't tell him about... What is it? You shouldn't tell him about Frodo, and you shouldn't tell him about that his son is dead. In fact, you probably shouldn't speak at all. That was funny. I didn't think it was funny when he did start talking and then, you know, oh, now you have to fight and that whole thing, but the bit with Gandalf, Gandalf saying, just don't say anything, that was, that was funny. I think that might more or less... From the end of... Um, you know, with the, oh, I should maybe briefly say, the various endings, I don't have a lot to say, I like the various ones, you know, the coronation of Aragorn and him meeting back up with Arwen and uh, Arwen, anyway, and them, you know, finally together and that, I... I don't know, the, their kind of love story didn't do a huge amount for me personally over the course of the trilogy, but it, still, it, it was nice to see it resolved and it was a good resolution. Although I did think that the whole love triangle thing just felt like it kind of just... It stopped, you know. the. Eowyn, I think was her name, we has Thoromir, I think was his name, back, and then they just kind of, and then she's not interested in Aragorn anymore, which is good, because Arwen has given up her immortality for him. So yeah, that kind of, and, and I like that they bow before the hobbits. When Aragorn says you shouldn't bow before anyone, I can't help but mentally MST3K and add, you're short enough as it is. But but yeah, he bows to. I especially understand with Frodo and Sam 
Less so with Pip and Mary, but okay. And I, I do appreciate it, you know, the, the gesture. And it is true, without Frodo and Samwise, it wouldn't really have gone as well as it did. And then the... Yeah, let's see, we have Sam marrying that a waitress that he was in love with. It was, it was nice. A, a good happy ending there as well. <laughs> Multiple happy endings, judging by the amount of progeny he presents, or is presented with when he comes back. And the, 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 the two kids won't even have to grow a lot before they're the same size as their parents, so that's good. I really should stop making short jokes. I swear, it's the fellowship that made me do it. That movie has so many short people jokes about hobbits. Anyway, I think that pretty well covers the different endings, other than the one that I really want to comment on. Yes, I think so. And then we have Bilbo and Frodo going off with the elven people, I think. I, I really don't know the different races. I followed as best I could. And, you know, it, it comes as a surprise that Frodo leaves to the three hobbits. And then, as he says, you know, that we saved the Shire, but it's just, you know, there are some things that can't be, you know, time can't heal. And, I think that that's a really important thing to get in there as well. While it did not happen to the three other hobbits, although arguably Merry and Pip did not experience anywhere near as harsh conditions as Frodo and Sam, but the fact that Sam still made it, it depends on the person's constitution and exactly what they experience. We also want to note that Sam was never really close to being taken over by the ring. He was not the bearer of the ring. He was more like the bodyguard of Frodo, the, the friend and companion. And I do very much like their camaraderie. It is very evocative of the kind of camaraderie that you know, soldiers fighting alongside each other share. They depend entirely on each other, and I find that the trilogy does a good job of getting that across without it being excessive. I, I never felt like their relationship was, I don't know, annoying or poorly done or anything. But, but yes, yeah, Sam is... is not too damaged by it, but Frodo, I, I actually read that in the, the, the novel version, has been diagnosed with PTSD, and that makes a lot of sense. It's what he's been through. A lot of people come home from war and can't return to a normal life. And I, I am very impressed with that actually being, because I, as far as I understand, that really was in Tolkien's original story, that that would be in a story from that far back, that this realization that war destroys some people, even if they come back with their limbs intact. You know, a finger short, but nonetheless. And Frodo just can't... Yeah, he, it, it's... And, and it's a good thing that he realizes that, because most people are kind of forced to just try to deal with real life afterwards, and many of them crack or snap, or even pop. I'm sorry, that's terrible. And, and not the joke itself, but the fact that I'm making a joke in this kind of... The joke was bad, but uh, yeah. And... Yeah, it, it just, it's something that people don't focus enough on when you know, dealing with war. We really do have to t 
take care of veterans when they come back and they just can't readjust to regular life because that is very typical. It's, um, I don't think that we can truly understand it, those of us who have not been in a war zone. And yeah, it's just, I, I find it great that it's in this so beloved story that it's communicated to people. And even, you know, again with the book and these movies being, the movies are like PG-13, I think that the books are supposed to be like, children could basically read them, although they're not entirely, they're not made as children's books, I'm, I'm not entirely sure. And, but, but yeah, anyways, like teenagers at least could grasp that concept and understand that war is a necessary evil. It's not something we should want or hope for. It's a possible last resort if it, it comes to that. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.